Hi. We well, we have met. We met yesterday in a tech a, a tech test. So this is not the first time we've ever had a little conversation. Can I can I start with a question? Can I go right ahead into a question? Uh, let's uh, go by alphabetical order, uh, David Byrne. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. Uh, this is one that I think, yeah. Uh, lots of people would probably want to ask you uh, when you're beginning work on a book. Uh, do you plan plan it out in advance? Um, do you plan out the plotting and how the various threads are going to expand and weave and interact and come together or not come together or whatever uh, in advance? Is there a whole lot of diagramming, or do you? start with a bunch of characters and see what the, what they want? Or is it a struggle between one, the diagramming and the characters pushing and pulling on the threads? Sure, thank you very much, David. Um, it's It has elements of both of those, certainly. Uh, the analogy I tend to reach for is a road trip through a country that I don't know very well. I would have heard about a few things before I set out. Um, in terms of a narrative, this means I know that I'd like this character to have this encounter. I'd like a scene that I might have been dreaming about for years to happen roughly here. Uh, I'd like this to happen towards the end, but I don't know exactly what the ending is. So if it's a road trip through the alphabet, then I might know what what will happen at point D. I might know what will happen with that little LMN sequence. Uh, I no, I really want to get Q in. Not sure about Y or Z yet, but X is, I've got a pretty strong idea about that. Then I set off. Um, I'll have some kind of a beginning. Uh, I know roughly the direction because I want to get to point C, uh, which might be a, 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 a scene, an, uh, an encounter, a set piece, a fragment maybe I've cannibalized and something that didn't work some years ago um and then when i get to see i have a better idea of the view uh, of how to get to the next fixed point it may turn out that c isn't as great as i thought it was but there's something really good next door uh, or it may turn out that c was better than i hoped for and i know that i'll be staying in for good and so i go in that semi-planned semi semi-improvised way um through the narrative through the alphabet, and hopefully, what usually happens is is I get about a third of the way through and realise why it's not working. Uh, throw out my road trip analogy and start again. Uh, but I find that's helpful. Um, sometimes I think I'm building this beautiful stone edifice, but it just turns out that I'm assembling the scaffolding for the real thing that I then have to build. That's okay too. Uh, that's a rambling kind of an answer to a very concise question. Uh, I wonder if I can sort of biff the shuttlecock of conversation back over the net at you. Uh, in, in, yeah. in your book, I just happen to have a copy of here, uh, you do talk <laughs> quite extensively about composition. Um, I, you talk about improvising and finding forms when you improvise, but I wonder... Um, it's been a little while since I've read the book. If, 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 if you'd like to share how you write a song, does it vary between songs? Um, it varies a lot um, between songs. And I, I've found over the years that there's many, there's all sorts of ways to do it. Um, and, and you can, uh, in many cases, like I've done a couple of uh, musicals now mm -hmm. where the, there's an element of storytelling in the song or at least character building where it's the character is evolving and something new is happening to them at this point and so you've got to tell what they're feeling through the song at that point and so the song is really kind of there's kind of an assignment it's a bit of puzzle, puzzle solving uh that you have to do with the lyrics and so the lyrics in that case have to come first and okay. and then the there has to be a melody to, to either support that or undercuts it or whatever it is you want to do. And then I've also done months where 
there's no lyrics at all and uh in the beginning there's a lot of improvised music and i'll sometimes uh scat and improvise melodies and uh, vocalese or vocal syllables against yeah. that and that a kind of melody or shape can kind of uh, uh, appear and emerge and then the very last thing the very last thing might be finding words that fit those those sounds so then when i do it that way when when the writing is like that i'm i assume that um if there's a consonant sound or a verb sound or an o or an oo or ah or whatever that that i improvise that there's that there's a reason for that 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 hmm. sound has a um an emotional uh import and i have to honor that in the word so i have to have a word that ends in an oo if that's what i improvised and uh, so it it becomes a bit of a challenge and I often end up, end up with songs that are, um, let's say, maybe a series of aphorisms as opposed to a well-plotted uh, kind of journey. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, that's pretty glorious. Uh, the sounds choose themselves. Um, I, 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 I don't really want to focus the whole for the whole of our conversation on your earlier work, David. But um, how did Izimba come about? Uh, that, that, uh, was that a case of this sort of er uh, language, uh, or did that the... that was uh, someone else's er language? Um, we had the music. I was having no success. We had a music. We had a kind of again a kind of gibberish, improvised melody uh, yeah. that Brian Eno helped with, and then we were having absolutely no luck. I was having no luck uh, getting words to fit it. And I think I'm pretty, I'm pretty sure it was Brian who said uh, we had a a book about kind of data and other kinds of performance art in yeah. the studio, and there was uh, a kind of nonsense poem. Uh, there was a few different ones. The most famous one is by Kurt Schwitters, uh, the artist. But this one happened to be by another guy named Hugo Ball, and. Um, it, we could, with a few little, a little adjustment, we could make it fit the melody. And uh, yes, and it was complete nonsense. Yeah. Um, I can't help but feel it's slightly unfair that a musician can get away with that. But if I handed in uh, an, uh, a short story written in Ur language to my editor, they'd be sending it back in quite, <laughs> in quite short order. <laughs> um, it's, um, yes. The uh, Kurt Schwitters, I think Kurt Schwitters, uh, his nonsense poem, uh, the Ur Sonata, I think it goes on for 40 minutes. It's quite, yeah, it's, an, it's an epic. Whoa. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, I don't know. Um, th 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 this, uh, I've, I've got a list of questions prepared here and several, um, I I'd sort of like to find uh, an, an, an organic, the pathway through them and maybe it'll work the same way uh, for you several of the things you said point to different uh, that they point to different questions in my list uh but i'm going to go for for the shortest one if, if if i could have a turn for a moment which is this since we were talking about language um is music a language and if so what are its basic grammatical rules uh, i don't know if that's simply too vast yeah, that's good to, to, to that's pretty it's pretty vast uh let's take but it, it does fit from uh what we were just talking about i think that there's a um kind of oral uh, oral language that is um sometimes connected with the actual literal meaning of the words and other and other times not that you can i mean we all know that there's a whole language in ums and ahs and who ah, <laughs> all the kind of vocal utterances that we make that convey yeah. a lot of emotion and meaning but don't make yeah. any literal sense well i think a lot of kind of melodies and the way we sing and the tone of the voice the way the, the what the rhythm is doing to the, the the voice and uh to the melody there's a lot of meaning that's conveyed that way uh that's well, it's a little up. It's a 
for someone trying to analyze what what a song is about, that's a little bit hard because it's not there's nothing literal about it. But it certainly yeah. has an impact. I think it's yeah. yeah, it has a huge impact, and that's that's maybe something that's hard to do in a novel. <laughs> yes, as you said, if you turned if you turned in a a, a long bit of yes, ums and ahs and shouts and shrieks, yes. <laughs> Uh, but wait a minute. Okay, that's going to lead me to. I'm going to find a question out of this. Um, in your writing, there's a rhythm. There's a rhythm. Rhythm in the writing. There's a. Uh, not, and I don't mean just in the sentences. I mean there's a, a little bit more macro. Where there's places where the 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 plot or the story rushes ahead, things happen, and then then there's be a period where not much happens, where it's kind of everything's been put on pause or in slow motion. And we're we're looking at the tea coming out of the, the the teapot, or things in the room, or what someone's wearing, or this or that. And then maybe it, there's another rhythm, and then it speeds up again. Um, and obviously, obviously, it would get monotonous if it stayed in one place all the time. But I thought, how do, are you aware of that? Do you are you as you're working to go? I need I need to I need to slow down in this bit. Yes, uh, I think there is an artistic principle, um, and um, maybe it's a little bit akin to sequencing tracks on an album, and how um, and how the sequence you put them in alters the listening experience and alters the meta narrative of um, of the music of an album, as opposed to the spoken or the lyric narrative of an album uh, the principle is pretty simple uh, don't put two things that are too similar to each other next to each other uh, uh, just be aware of tonal distance or emotional distance um, uh, loud and slow uh, sorry um, loud and quiet are two mm -hmm. obvious obvious Fast and slow are two obvious opposites. Uh, violent and peaceful are obvious opposites. So we could call this sort of the principle of obvious opposites. Obvious opposites uh, sit well next to each other. Um, or you can um, so you can slowly increase them. You can sort of slide up the fader and turn down the fader. Uh, however, things that are very similar. So a scene full of dialogue, putting that next to another scene full of dialogue i tend to avoid that uh i find kind of the sugar rush of dialogue uh, for some reason your eyeball sits up and pays attention the moment it meets speech marks which is why um even fairly mediocre dialogue it's still quite engaging i don't know why but um maybe it 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 might be something to do with how we learn to speak just by watching um, speakers speak. I think maybe this uh, taps into this infancy atavistic uh, uh, habit of mind uh, on the page. You pay attention when there's dialogue and you tend to, you, you, your, your eyeball can slightly switch off a bit once the speech marks end and you have a beautiful page of prose, but um, if it goes on too long, then the eyeball tends to nod off a little bit. Um, there are ways to make it not nod off, but this is why I say I'd, um, I try to alternate. Dialogue heavy scene, go, a, a dialogue light scene. You could also, in, yeah, yeah, yeah. So in that case, uh, do you ever skip ahead? Do you ever skip ahead and go, okay, um, I'm going to follow on this character, in this case, we've got a, a band, so it's like five five characters in the band or so, something like this, and the manager yeah. and whatever. So you might go, I'm, I'm going to follow Elf for a while, even though I know it's going to be interspersed with other other people and other characters. I'm going to yeah. follow that thread. And then you'll then come back and then insert other... Do you, would, would you do like that? Or would you kind of... Yes. Uh, I see. Yeah. Yeah, uh, the former day, for sure. If um, if it's going well and you're being handed something, not not necessarily in a mystical way, but uh, if 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 a plot is revealing itself fairly fluidly, then uh, I'm not going to say not now, not now. I'll take you later, and uh, it's yeah, yeah. someone else now. Uh, I'm I'm just 
grateful that it's going well and, uh, and even if it's the middle of the night and I need to sleep, then at least I'll make sketchy notes uh, for that. Um, and it's, 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 yeah, you can sort out the order later. First, you need things, you sort of have to assemble uh, the, the raw materials, the scenes, the characters to, um, to, 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 to have something to sort out. Um, that's how it works for me in narrative. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm curious with, um, um, uh, with your, uh, with your musical about, um, Imelda Marcos. Um, yeah. Uh, that's a real person's life. Uh, to, uh, to some degree, the narrative pre already exists. I'm wondering um, which sections of that real life you chose to song guys, if I could uh, invent a verb, to, 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 to turn into the dot-to-dot -dot points on the dot-to-dot -dot of your musical. Uh, what was the point? What did you skip and why? What were the principles going on there? Well, as you were saying about, uh, say, sometimes you can get a third of the way in and realize, oh, no, I'm, I've hit a dead end or I have to rethink all this. Um, originally, uh, that story, the story of Imelda Marcos, the former first lady of the Philippines, um, was a kind of a contrast between her and her former maid or housekeeper, who, when Imelda was a child, was kind of lived with the family and was only a few years older than Imelda. And so they became kind of playmates and very close, et cetera, et cetera. And the, the maid um, thought of herself as part of the family, um, mm. very, which is very common in the Philippines. But then of course, Imelda, her, her life circumstances change incredibly. <laughs> she, she becomes first lady and at that point, uh, she doesn't really have much to do with her old friend anymore. So I, I, so I thought, oh, this would be a kind of compare and contrast. I can follow the two different lives in parallel, one who ends up in a kind of shanty town and one who ends up in the palace. And yeah. hist historically, uh, they do, there, are, there are intersections later on where... Uh, Someone wrote a biography of Imelda and, and uh, interviewed the, the maid, and Imelda was very upset. So she basically put the maid, her former friend, under house arrest. Um, and then things like this. So, uh, yes, yeah, so they do intersect again, uh, but somehow, uh, but, but then, <laughs> then I. I'd heard a rumor in some of the, audio, the biographies that I read about Imelda. I, I heard that when she was a, a young, beautiful woman, uh, she dated uh, Benigno Aquino, who later on became her husband's chief political rival. And okay, and uh, and I thought, oh, that's a little too pat. The uh, and and, I th and it's only kind of gets mentioned in passing in a, in the biographies, and then I talked to someone um, here in, in New York and who knew Aquino very well and said, "No, it's really true. Um, they were very close. She hoped that they would get married. She lost her virginity to him, and this was a major deal. And the fact that he went off and uh, married." Corey Aquino, um, who Imelda just saw as a, a girl from a richer family, um, sort of, which is partly correct, um, set a, a very different tone. <laughs> and I mm -hmm. thought, because, because Aquino comes back, uh, Aquino, of course, uh, is sent into exile. He comes back uh, and uh, when... Uh, Imelda's husband has declared has made it a dictatorship, and Aquino was assassinated, and that triggers the whole chain of events that topples the whole Marcos regime. So that I thought, oh well, this kind of gives it a whole a real ending. 
um, the story with the maid did not give it an ending, really. Yeah, uh, yeah. So yeah, as you, yeah. It's a long so, answer. Sorry. No, fine. No, it's um, it, it's it's interesting that um, narrative narrative forms have a certain have a certain gravity. Different narrative forms um, have a different kind of a pull, and to a certain degree, they they announce themselves as the, um, the narrative to go for. There's just something inherently tastier about certain plots than certain other plots. Maybe not to everyone, but uh, but uh, but mm -hmm. but to whoever it is who's making the plot. Uh, and and in a sense, you don't almost need to compare and contrast them that cerebrally. They just uh, they are tastier. Um, if, if if we could stay with narrow for a moment of a of, of, of a slightly different kind uh, just your your most recent uh, your most recent show American Utopia is 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 a rather beautiful combination of um, of a career retrospective in some ways but um, with the songs fairly radically reinterpreted uh, if that's a fair assessment then um I'd like to um I suppose first observe that with the body of work that you've made, you could choose five completely different shows, each satisfying, uh, but which would not overlap uh, depending on the songs you choose uh, from your uh, uh, from your respectable number of albums. Uh, I'd just like to ask uh, what drew you towards choosing the songs you did to reinterpret the way you did why them and why not others and, and and is it a bit like your last answer there were just some sort of roots through your body of work which struck you as tastier than others or was there a, um, a, a, a mastermind plan at work that um that, 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 that you'd like to share with us over um there was there was a little bit of a, a plan and and i tried out different songs different song sequences and some worked better than others and it was it was fairly intuitive um although i've realized at some point that there was this for want of a better phrase there was a kind of arc where mm. the the character on stage that would be me uh, or me playing someone very much like me um starts off very inwardly directed holding a a brain in his hand and yeah. he's uh he's very much inside him of himself and then at some point he uh, kind of is kind of merged from that and he finds a little community the band and there's 11 of them so there's 12 all together in this little community and so it's enough to be make a little a little a little grouping yeah. and that allows him to emerge a bit out of himself and i realized that by the end the whole community has begun to engage with the, the wider world and in, in kind of in a civic way, in a way of talking about social issues and this and that. Um, so I thought, okay, this is the journey of that seems to be happening here. That yeah. seems comfortable. Yeah. And so there's certain songs that are not going to work in there. Psycho Killer does not belong in that story. <laughs> uh, there's audience members who may want to hear that, but Luckily, my, I have enough in my catalog um, yeah. that I can choose other songs that sort of help act as stepping stones to take you on that kind of journey. And yeah. I, some, some of them, we try them out and never go, no, that doesn't feel right. Um, it doesn't feel like it's, it's take, we need something to get from whatever to A to C. And that, is, that B that we've chosen does, isn't it. We have to find yeah. something else. Yeah, uh, and it's yeah. It's in the case of a song like that, it's very intuitive. We're not just going by the, the, the words, what the song says. Sometimes we are, but not always. Sometimes it's about how it feels. If um, I realize that sometimes I, in this show, I would I talk to the audience a fair amount, and I talk about you know, a bunch of different subjects, and sometimes raise a question or whatever. And I realize that sometimes, in a way, when I talk, that. It, it, it in a way it poses an emotional kind of question 
Mm. And the song that comes after answers the question, not in a literal way, of course, but in, in an emotional way. So the kind of the, the puzzle or the need or whatever is framed and then it gets resolved in the song, if that makes any sense. It makes a lot of sense. Um, uh, I'm in, in, in order to learn what my musicians in my book uh, know and work with and take for granted for the first time in my life, I, I, I had to take music lessons. Uh, I tried the guitar for a while, but it was the piano that I've most gelled with and, uh, mm -hmm. and I'm uh, still continue with that now. Uh, my piano teacher often talks about this line asks a question, the next line answers it. Uh, hickory dickory dock. Da, 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 da. There's a question and an answer. And mm -hmm. she points to that principle even in more, much more complex work. Uh, I'm wondering if question and answer is, is a basic artistic unit that works uh, both for musical phrases, but also for um, if, if, if it's a sort of a two stroke engine, which um, can work for something on a more macro scale, like compiling a show. Uh, I'd like to float that back to you and also just to sneak one more in. Uh, the guy holding the brain, uh, I thought of Hamlet and his skull uh, in the graveyard scene in Hamlet. Uh, alas, poor Yolik, I knew him well, just the way he's holding the brain. And I was just wondering if there was a conscious allusion to that. In your face, I was expecting perhaps There was, a, there was a, uh... <laughs> 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 I thought it very, oh, well, I realized it's very different. He's talking about death and uh, what what's left of us and uh, but mm. and i'm thinking about what's going on inside of me right now this is i'm okay. like talking to okay. my my the inside of my head but i i i, yeah. I intentionally do the ha kind of hamlet pose where i i hold okay. it up in front of my eyes and turn and look at it it kind of adopting that pose um yeah uh oh wait backing <laughs> up uh wow uh, the question uh, answer. uh or questions and answers. Community. Yes, I'm. I think so, uh, there's some of that. There's a lot of emotional, emotional call and response, or emotional um, calling out, and then something resolves it. Um, I, I had a conversation once with a, a screenwriter, a woman named Joan Tewksbury, who wrote, uh, amongst other things, she wrote the script for Nashville. The, the Robert Altman movie. And yeah. I asked her, how, you know, how do you, the scenes don't seem to have anything to do with one another. Um, you you jump from one thing to another and, uh, it's not a, it's not a conventional narrative thread. Um, this will be yeah, familiar to you. And, and I said, well, how do you do that? How do you make it so that it feels, it doesn't feel disjointed and it doesn't, uh, feel like you've just been suddenly uh, there's no rhyme or reason to it. And she said, sometimes you can set up uh, the emotion in one scene and the emotion will kind of resolve or continue in the next scene, even though all the characters have changed and you're a completely different place in time. And I thought, wow. Uh, wow. It's like the, just, uh, the masks have been switched. I thought, oh, well, this will be familiar. There's an element yeah. of that in your writing um, where the, the mask gets switched, but the the thing that's underlying it just flows right through um, for the breeder. Oh, but oh, uh, I'm going to go back to your guitar lessons and whatever, whatever else you did. <laughs> yeah, did um, yeah, I want to know what other research was involved. Did you, for example, um, I'm old enough to have been in, uh, let's see, high school at the tail end of the sixties in, uh, yeah, so when, when this book okay. takes place. Uh, so I don't, I, I, there's parts of this, that this era that I remember it as young, young person, but parts of it are probably like for most people nowadays, there is, it's historical fiction. It's a historic, it's historical. So I, a lot of what I, yeah assume about that era I've gotten from books and movies that have recreated it. Uh, 
bios, biographies that I've read, um, and a million music documentaries that I've looked at, and some of which are you know absolutely atrocious, but sometimes it's yeah. uh, it's just like candy. You just go, oh, I, maybe I'll just watch it. I don't really care about this band, but I think I'll. I'm curious to see what, yeah, what, yeah, their, yeah. what their trajectory was. Um, and I wondered, yes, if you were drawn into that, that drown that down that rabbit hole of uh, uh, all that I, stuff. In a sense, I've I, I've I've always lived there, David. Um, um, I'm I'm of an age. You are too. Uh, when. Um, it's not just the art that you practice uh, is the art you spend time in and with. Um, I grew up watching TV. I grew up with a vinyl collection, then a cassette collection, then to CDs. And often it, it, it wasn't necessarily literature that was my interface with the world. Uh, that was my first port of call when it came to understanding questions or thinking about questions like who am i um the first time i met philosophical questions it would probably have been in music uh perhaps only to a certain depth compared to reading a book of nietzsche or something but um uh, <laughs> but, 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 uh but when you're 13 you go for the song you don't yeah. really reach the book of philosophy and so uh, this has always sort of been in the compost heap and I actually had a question called the compost heap, which we might get to, but maybe we're already in it. Um, uh, we'll see. Uh, the same goes for films. Um, and more recently, it's actually YouTube. Uh, my, my number one rabbit hole or, or, or the, the kind of the black rabbit hole, if we can combine a black hole and a rabbit hole, the one that really sucks me down irresistibly. Uh, it's, uh it, it's interviews with um with musicians who i know often from the past many of them who uh, uh they have no longer alive um and i would notice in previous books i've spent so much time um uh not writing by uh scouring or, or hunting down a new interview with Brian Jones and I heard had come on the, uh, that someone had posted uh, uh, from speaking for 40 seconds in 1966, or um, there's a, there's, there's a comedy gold one where uh, uh, a traditional music critic with the bow tie, I think in the Nether in Netherlands is, is, is interviewing Roger Waters and Sid, Barrett, and he, he clearly has no idea what I think CMLE play. Uh, he's, he's just witness. He has no idea what that was about. And and it is a bafflement as he's asking, well, why does it have to be so loud? It's too loud for me personally. I just can't take it so loud. Um, I just find myself uh, watching these over and over and over. Sometimes even once. This is ridiculous. I better write a book about this, so at least my research can be legitimate. Uh, at least it's for something. Uh, there's other reasons why, why I wrote the book as well. But um, uh, yes, I, I'm not a musician. Uh, I was in no bands. Um, I, I'm, I'm, I'm envious of you. Uh, I'm envious of your tribe. I'm envious of the way you get to collaborate with other musicians. You get to make a whole, but individually you can't make, but with others who have similar skills, but not identical, but not identical skills. You can kind of build a sonic pyramid. Uh, if you're a novelist, you only, I mean, what you have, of course, is years, uh, but you can't build anything that's bigger than yourself because you are the only one making all the decisions. Uh, I suppose we get to think about them and calculate uh, at our leisure, and it can add up to years, and it is with this book. Whereas I guess when you're performing live, decisions have to have to be made instantly. Um, but maybe you can understand a slight wistfulness that my tribe feels towards yours. Uh, you get to interact with the audience. You get to interact with, I guess, at some point, your friends uh, on stage and make something that has energy and propulsion. 
might exist only for the length of the time that it takes to play the song. But um, sometimes compared to that, what I do for a living feels quite museum-like, or, or it, 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 it's as if I'm a medieval monk in the scriptorium working for years, making a copy of, of, of the Book of Kells or, 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 or something compared to you. Um, I'm not sure if this is a question, question or an observation, but I'd like to float it your way and uh, I suppose uh, ask if you can understand what I've said um, and maybe if there's aspects of other areas of art that, um, that you have a um, that you have an attraction towards. Over. Okay. Oh, wow. Um, yes, of course. I, you know, I'm aware that uh, the the world I'm in often appears a little bit more glamorous than it is. Uh, I remember. <laughs> that was like yeah. such understatement. Yeah, understatement. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> you find that. Yeah, I remember friends me uh, kind of coming to say hello backstage and then looking around at some kind of dressing room where the kind of shower stall is falling in and everything else and going, this is it. This is it. This is what this is what your life is, <laughs> and, uh, which, uh, but it's also true that it's that it's it's very ecstatic, ecstatic. There's a um, as you say, there's a chance to really kind of connect or relate to an audience immediately. I mean, in a very visceral kind of way. Um, there's there's this, of course pluses and minuses. Part of what I do is a, a performance. Uh, it's not just write. It's not say just writing. There, I'm sometimes envious of songwriters who can write and then go. Okay, uh, they'll write for someone else. Like a lot of country songwriters mm -hmm. will do that. They'll write for someone else, yeah. and then the someone else has to do all the work of touring for a year of performing yeah. the song <laughs> over and over again. Whereas the songwriter is just gets the, from the checks just start coming in, um, and. Yes, I'm aware, that, uh, although I enjoy it very much, I'm aware that there's an absurdity sometimes uh, about the fact that I have to perform the same song over and over and over again every night. And although it's for, in a strange way it works, uh, but, I, but it's also, uh, I have to physically be there. The part of, the, of what makes the art form work is my physical body. Yeah. My body has to be there on the stage. I can't send someone else. Um, <laughs> I can't write. I could write it and phone it in or whatever. I have to physically be there. So it's it's that's part of the power, but it's also kind of part of the the uh, liability. Yeah, it's often true. Those two are uh, the two faces of exactly the same coin. Um, it, it, that, that, I, I I find this happening a lot. The payoff is the price and the price is the payoff um you mentioned documentaries you also mentioned um a, a, a persona who is like you but not you for the um american utopia show um i recently watched a fairly new david bowie documentary called finding fame which starts pretty much when he leaves school and finishes up with ziggy stardust and it, yes I've, I've seen that yeah. one yeah um yeah. Could you relate to that, David? Um, he never really got off the ground until he 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 found a, a similar or not so similar, who knows, but a persona uh, or a mask to kind of slip sideways into and then be that. While he was trying to be himself, it just didn't quite gel. Um, could you relate I to was, that? I was, uh, yeah, I was surprised um, when I knew that he'd done things before he before people like myself became aware of what he was doing. Mm. Um, I knew there was a history before that, but I didn't know how much of a history. Yeah. And, and I'm watching this documentary and going, this guy is beating his head against the wall, getting yeah. knocked yeah. down, writing mm. some you know ridiculous song in some some particular <laughs> genre or whatever. Like you, you mentioned the, <laughs> the laughing gnome song or whatever. <laughs> yeah. Yes. And, 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 and he gets knocked down. It's like, are you serious? And then he just eventually gets back up and 
and goes for it again. It goes, I've got another, yeah. I've got another idea. I've got an, I've got an adjusted, wait, wait, wait. Now hear this. Uh, and I just thought he went through, I don't know how many records and personas and uh, performances and uh, all things it, uh, until if something finally clicked. And I just thought, um, I don't know if I would have ever been that persistent. I don't know if I, I, I think if I had been knocked down that many times, I, th I might have thought maybe people just don't like what I do and I should think about looking for another kind of employment. And uh, I'm glad he didn't, but didn't do that. But I thought that's really, I thought it was really extraordinary and sometimes kind of heartbreaking. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Could just get yeah. smacked down over and over again. Um, it makes, it makes you think of shows like, like X Factor where some, some get through because they are talented. Others seem to be invited on pretty much to humiliate themselves. Um, and and uh, it's, it's 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 interesting how the line between those two isn't necessarily to do with the talent. And and if 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 I understand what you just said, then maybe a certain amount of success early on is a prerequisite for, for, for just to have a career uh, that, uh, that that spans the years and the decades. Um, which slightly brings me to a question. Um, I just wanted to ask about song fame as opposed to personal fame. Uh, I'm curious if you have any sense as to why certain songs attain um, a fame or maybe an, an immortality that other songs, at least on, that on the face of it, um, don't quite. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm just wondering, for example, why, why so many people would want to um, love watching you perform once in a lifetime. Whereas for me, listening, uh, the listening wind off mm -hmm. of the same album, I, it's possibly one of my favourite uh, tracks from that era of your career. Have you got any sense as to why some just live and continue um, on stage and? Parents get their kids into it. Their kids get their kids into that song, uh, and not others. Uh, I can only guess. I, I think maybe "Once in a Lifetime" was uh, is one of those songs where it expresses a kind of everyone's kind of universal uh, angst or puzzlement or confusion, going like, "Who am I? What did I do? How did I end up here? Why?" Mm -hmm. Is this a decision I made? Did I make a decision that that ended it, that brought me to this place? And uh, I don't recognize the person I have become. All those kinds of mm -hmm. things that we all feelings that we all have, and everybody recognizes it. And I thought, uh, luckily, I sort of juxtaposed that, as you were saying about the scenes, dialogue scenes, and with uh, other kinds of scenes. Uh, I juxtaposed that with a kind of more ecstatic chorus. Um, the chorus is more kind of uplifting and celebratory, um, not in a literal way, but it, it feels that way. And, yeah. and yet the verses and the verses are confused and uh, kind of, where am I and what's happening to me? And then the chorus is kind of emotionally saying, it's all right, it's going to be all right. Yeah. And I think yeah. that's, that's a sentiment that, that uh, everyone kind of can, can identify with that's pretty gorgeous so uh so there's a almost a, a centrifugal force that's flinging you out into um frightening places uh existentially and then there's a centrifugal force that's hugging you close to uh, a core that is warmer and secure uh both expressed in the words and maybe in the music as well mm-hmm mm-hmm all right, I, I'm going to ask you, um, did, when you started on uh, Utopia Avenue, did you uh, know that you wanted it to be this era? Uh, it's, I realized, as we were saying earlier, that uh, given the number of, the amount of time that's passed, this is now historical fiction. Um, mm -hmm. It's not people in Victorian dress and... Uh, 
and all that, but it's far enough away from most pe what most people would have uh, lived through or experienced, to say most readers, I'm, I'm assuming, uh, that now it's, it's entered into the realm of history. Um, and I wondered if that was important, important for you. Um, well, the era pretty much chose itself for me. Uh, to have a band like Utopia Avenue, um, a, 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 a strange, somewhat curated uh, mishmash of a band with folk influences, with psychedelic influences, with Dean the bassist, his pub rock R&B influences, all in the same band, to have them as artistically in, uh, interesting as I'm trying to persuade the reader they are. Uh, the early 60s, it's just, I, I don't think they could have plausibly existed. And if they had done, couldn't have plausibly gotten a record contract from any of the big four uh, who dominated the British music scene at that point. Uh, it can't be earlier than 67, 68. Uh, I'd also say that, um, yes, it is an, an earlier era. Uh, to that which most of the readers will be familiar with, including myself. Uh, but it's not just any other era. There's something magic about those two years. Whether it was or wasn't, uh, I don't know, but the way it is remembered, the way it is perceived, there was something special. Sergeant Pepper, um, Sergeant Pepper's is out in June 1967, I think. And mm -hmm. suddenly there's this whole new art form called the album, uh, which if they existed before, but more as containers of tracks. The idea that uh, an album can be a narrative, we're back to this theme again, which is interesting. Um, um, it's, it's, it's a journey, it's a transition. Um, there aren't characters in it the same way there's, there's a central character in, in American Utopia, but, but, but there is a flow. Um, there's this idea. They're, in a sense, the Beatles are doing a bit of a Bowie there as well. They're this fictitious band led by this fictitious guy, Sergeant Pepper. Um, they're also playing at not being themselves. Um, and I think I, 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 I'd, I'd be interested to know what, what you think. But uh, it seems to me that that album caused a lot of, to use the Amazon review rating system, three-star bands suddenly produced four-star albums, four-star albums with five-star passages in them. Um, and for a brief window of time, uh, partly enabled by the counterculture, which was in turn symbiotically enabling the music, a brief period of time, anything that was conceivable, you could have a bash at it. Uh, Frank Zappa could get a record deal at that time and put out an album. It's very hard to imagine him being you know, that door opening for him in, say, Mrs. Thatcher's England, uh, mm -hmm. or, 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 or even Nixon's America. Um, so it's, it, it's, it's, it's a magic time. Uh, it's not like any other time. Um, and I think this is one reason why it still retains a pull. Um, maybe this will change as the generations go by, but I'm not sure. Um, I know people in the 20s and 30s here in Ireland, and they too are drawn to to those uh, maybe magic three or four years, the music produced in that time, in a way that they're not, say, drawn to another block of three or four years, say, from the late 1980s or the mid-1990s. What do you think? Um, I know we're kind of overrunning, and at some point we need to oh, are bring we? in uh, Bernard here. Oh, we are. We are. But, um, okay, okay. okay. Yeah, um, but but, but uh, uh, I really don't want to interrupt you, and I can speak with you all evening. But... Part of me would like to think that uh, that there's no special time, that there's, it's only special according to the lens that we use to look at it. Mm -hmm. but, uh, but I also realize that... Um, that was those, those were my formative musical years as well when I was in high school and first hearing pop music, and I got exactly that feeling. I real I felt like anything's possible and anything could be popular. It's uh, mm -hmm. it you can be you can do the wildest 
music or music that makes a really important statement. Uh, and there were all kinds of, you know, various kinds of eccentric people. And I thought everything, anything can have a shot. At least it felt that way for a minute. And, uh, yeah. and everything and anything could be included. You could bring in influences from, from anything that came to your mind that you thought might work. Um, that kind of uh, curiosity was encouraged. And I thought that was really formative for me. Yeah. But now I, th now I think we have to go to bring back Bernard, right? I think we might. Um, Bernard, Bernard, can you hear us? Hey. Here he is. Hey. Hey. Um, I'm not quite sure what you, uh, uh, what the next stage is, Bernard, but I believe you were going to uh, bring in some audience questions. Oh, Mar Bernard, I think you're muted. My friend, you need to unmute yourself, I believe. Hello? There, there Hello. you are. Yes. Um, thanks for that. Yeah, we have some audience questions. Um, I'll, I'll ask a few of them, um, meant for the both of you. Um, and, and here's the first, and, and David Mitchell, maybe, maybe you could go first. Sure. Is, there's a question about creativity. And the audience member wants to know how do you feel your creativity has changed over time, and also um, how you think about creativity, whether it's um, something that's innate or a practice that gets honed over time. Um, David Mitchell, and then David Byrne. Sure. Um, hopefully, not to lower the tone of anything, but um, I'm I'm fighting away a, a YouTube clip of Lou Reed late on in his life. Uh, it was a uh, couple of years before he died, I think in Germany, by a keen young journalist. Um, how do you stay creative as you get older? And his answer, I'm afraid, was, I masturbate daily, which... Um, <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for laughing, David, because I would have died on the spot if you hadn't uh, laughed. But... Um, Creativity, uh, I, I don't really think about it very much. I, um, I but I do recognize a change uh, and it's something to do with a trade-off over time between sort of youthful impetuosity. Uh, oh, let's give that a go. Let's try this, let's try that. Um, say they're maybe most visibly in the structure of Cloud Atlas. Well, I just had the idea uh, what would it look like if you begin a story six times, stop it halfway through, um, continue with something completely different, um, work from the past into the future in the way, in, in terms of the when of these stories, get to the middle, and then come back out again in reverse order, a bit like sort of your a drill bit going through uh, a nest of Russian dolls. What would that look like? That, I would say, is a youthful and impetuous idea. Um, if it occurred to me now, I don't think necessarily I'd say, well, let's spend a couple of years seeing if this works or not. Uh, in inverted commas, I know better than to try. Um, sometimes it did work, sometimes it didn't work. Um, as I've learned more about narrative and writing, um, my, I, I make these rash decisions uh, much more infrequently. Uh, I hope this is balanced by uh, just a greater knowledge of, of, of what writing is, a more conscious, studied um, perception. For example, um, one five-star metaphor is worth far more. It, 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 it's worth... 10 times 10 three star metaphors. So I will now go through everything I've done. And if, 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 if anything is less than a four star metaphor, it's out. If I can't decide if it's three or four, it's out. Uh, whereas when I was younger, if I look back at my first books, there's just imagery everywhere. It's like barnacles on the, uh, on the hull of a yacht. So I think that's how my, um, uh, that's something I've noticed. Uh, in 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 
how I how I make narrative. Have you noticed anything, David, as uh, years have gone by, things you do differently now that you didn't when you were uh, younger? Uh, I've noticed that, yes, there's aspects of my writing that have changed a lot. Um, there's a lot of the kind of youthful, in my case, youthful anxieties um, and kind of twitchy, nervous, whatever, uh, that manifested in the music and the lyrics. And although I can reconnect with that sometimes, that's still a part of me. It's not, it's a smaller part of me than it used to be. I, I now write about other things and often explore other avenues. And uh, I realized that, yes, yeah, that my curiosity and my, the things that I am able to do change over the years. And there will always be people who, I liked that nervous uh, anxiety ridden guy. He was the guy I liked and you're not that guy anymore. Mm -hmm. And I think to myself, uh, thank God for that. But, <laughs> <laughs> uh, on, uh, but it, on a personal, yes, on a personal <laughs> level, but on a, yeah, on an artistic level, I can kind of, on an artistic level, I can kind of see what someone means. I mean, your, our lives are made up of many lives and, uh, we're yeah, doing the best we can with each one of the lives that we have to live through. Um, it's hard to imagine you writing uh, One Fine Day, uh, on uh, uh, which is on your 2010 album with Vianino. Uh, it's, 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 it's hard to imagine something as as grounded and, and um, I wouldn't say resplendent as that on Fear of Music. Uh, it seems, uh, yes, and would uh, never happen. Uh, never happen. Um, on uh, on page thirty nine of your book, not that I've been trolling <laughs> you, uh, you write, "I've come to believe that you can escape your demons and still tap the well." Maybe this is what we're talking about. Not quite escape your demons, but learn to peacefully coexist with your demons and exactly. still tap. They're them not on. controlling yeah. you. Yeah. Yeah. Um, not in the area of music or, 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 or these beautiful songs that you bequeath the world and people not yet born even, uh, but just in the area of narrative, I can relate to the thing about demons uh, a lot. Bernard, mm. you've reappeared. Gentlemen, uh, I apologize for the static before. I, I, hope, I hope you can hear me clearly now. Um, we're, we're just about an hour in, um, uh, I know that uh, uh, most of us would sit here and, and listen to you for a, a lot longer, and I, I hope there is a, another opportunity to um, convene you both, ideally um, in person. There, there are a that. lot of audience members and uh, are, are curious about what these last months have been like for you, um, uh, David. You being in in relatively rural Ireland, uh, Ireland, excuse me, um, David Mitchell. That is David Byrne. You're here. Uh, as I am in, in Manhattan. Um, any observations? Um, what's it meant to you um, as, as citizens, um, as, as people who uh, uh, um, make things, um, often which are um, uh, informed by the times in which we're living? Um, I think a lot of, a lot of people uh, tuning in today would just like, like to hear you know, your, your thoughts about about what we've all been enduring these last several months. David, would you like to go in alphabetical order or reverse alphabetical order? No, no, order? no. You go first. You go first. Okay. Uh, briefly then, um, for a novelist in a rural context, uh, it, it, it hasn't been so very different. Uh, I spend a lot of time in this very room working. Um, of course, there is... There are psychic consequences, societal consequences, political consequences uh, that are toppling and and happening and erupting right now, and 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 it it, it will be the work of the next ten years to begin to sift through them. I think, uh, on a practical level, uh, 
several projects that I've been been planning to work on for years with 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 friends um um a filmmaker um uh someone who works on tv shows that that, that, that i've never been able to do uh we've never been able to do either because my friends been um busy or i've been busy chasing a deadline uh we've this is the first time in years we've both been free at the same time so i've actually been doing quite a lot of extracurricular non next book uh work um just because the pandemic has uh enforced uh the conditions that allow us to both be free uh and and to work on these things so i would predict with some degree of com confidence in the next two or three years i think we're in for quite an artistically fertile time uh of course the nature of that fertility remains to be seen but i can feel it uh i i sit in defeat so i i feel it in reported conversations with friends that's my answer How about you david in manhattan uh manhattan of course changed drastically uh, during lockdown when the pandemic hit. Um, and it brought a lot of things into relief that were, were always here, but kind of invisible, the kind of inequities and injustices. And then a lot of that erupted in the, in the kind of, in the various marches and protests uh, mm. that eventually came for, were, were triggered by George Floyd's murder. Um, so yeah, as you were saying, I think a lot of that, a lot of that sense that there are things wrong and we need to fix them, and and we're we're going to try our best to see if they that finally now we can press a reset button and a lot of things mm. can maybe be reevaluated. That's an extraordinary thing. Um, yeah, yeah. The, and. So a lot of people are being affected in this moment. It's a moment to reflect and think, uh, do I want to return to the world the way it was? In many cases, people think, no, no, now's yeah. the time to fix it. Um, creatively, uh, it's fine. Yes, I'm, I'm, <laughs> keep, I'm keeping very busy. I'm I, like you. There are many times I work alone uh, or just by myself, but I also miss uh i miss sometimes going out and just being among people even if i'm not yeah. performing or doing anything like that that part yeah. is something that i miss even though i'm very happy kind of working by myself at the same time it's a kind of strange contrast mm. thank you guys um i i'm having some technical Difficulties, so I think I won't uh, uh, expose uh, you all in the audience to any more of my static. Um, but we we pretty much out of time. I, I want to thank you both, um, and and at the same time, um, because you've been you've been so generous, uh, maybe suggest that you 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 each ask perhaps one more question. Um, I'll sign off, and so you'll you'll uh, simply say. Uh, good night and thank you again when, when it's done. I apologize to the audience for these technical difficulties, but David, the, 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 the floor is once more. Okay. Uh, uh, I understood from Bernard that we have one more parting shot each, David. Um, uh, and, and so I should really go for a, um, a concise um, aphoristic uh, type of a question, but uh, I'm going to do the opposite of what might be wise and just float this to you. What is music for? Uh, it's wow. It's a, it's a tool uh, that connects us with uh, with our bodies, with the kind of the rhythms and sounds and energies of our bodies, but and then also. It's a means of uh, connecting us with other people. Um, it is neither a good thing or a bad thing. It can be, music can be very bad. Um, 
it can also be very good. You see, yeah, it's it's a it's like a hammer, uh, in that sense. Um, okay, so now I get to ask you another one. Um, okay, okay. I want to ask you about free will. Uh, characters in in uh, novels. Um, you wonder if if they're you wonder when you're reading a novel if they're faded because it's because it's told as a story, you wonder, were they fated to end up where they ended up? Um, and is that is that the way we all are? And so I just want to let yeah, let you riff on that. Whoa, uh, you uh, you outplayed me, sir. Uh, <laughs> I thought my what is music for was a knockout punch from which there'd be no recovery. <laughs> <laughs> but you've uh, retaliated with with devastating aplomb. Yeah. Unfortunately, um, yeah, I did have it written down in my little notebook. Uh, I think you might have uh, touched on something exquisitely profound about the nature of narrative and why we as a species are addicted to it, uh, i.e., we see ourselves in every single character, in every single tale we ever are exposed to from the three little pigs who are fated every time we hear the mm -hmm. story to make the same stupid mistakes and feel the same fear and the same vulnerabilities. And, and the wolf is fated to do whatever, uh, well, however dark the version of that story uh, you're exposed to, uh, all the way through to Walter White uh, from Breaking Bad, a, a, a macro narrative, uh, very recent that uh, that is uh, th uh, that says whose arc is as as dramatic and far as any Victorian novel. Uh, the principle is we see people struggling with, well. They think they're making the decisions, but the story is already there. I think that's us. That's us lot. Trapped in time. We think we are deciding to end this call here. We think we have decided to have this conversation here. But, uh, of course, in the continuum of time, it's always going to be this way. This oxymoron, this paradox, this, uh, the, the, this, this, centrifugal versus centripetal pull between us being in charge and this sinking feeling that we're not in charge. Um, this is uh, this exists on the political plane that uh, uh, that you also uh, referred to with the murder of George, uh, of George Floyd, David. Um, this is true at many levels, um, but archetypally, it's there when we hear about a character in a tale. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Um, I think that might be a, a, a bit of a, a downer to end on. But, uh, but, but, uh, <laughs> but, yeah, the, the truth is we, are, we, we love that, though. Um, we're drawn to that. Yeah. 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 Well, uh, moths are drawn to flames. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> David, okay. uh, look, it's been a pleasure. Thank you for your time, yes, uh, and uh, and uh, I hope to meet you again one day. You too. Thank you. See you again. Goodbye. Bye. Needs to.